In this final mini lecture on neurotransmitter transporters, we are going to discuss them as proteins and we're going to count them. It's important to discuss what we call the alternating access model for how ion coupled transporters actually work. They have the problem of linking the transport of an ion to the transport of another small molecule. And so what the alternating access model says is that the transmitter transporter can exist facing two different compartments. When it faces the outside compartment, it waits for various molecules, various substrates to bind. Then it undergoes a conformational change which releases those substrates the other compartment, then it flips back and can do the same thing over and over again as those substrates are available. It can do this either by putting all of the molecules in the same compartment or by starting with them in different compartments. It's called symport, meaning transporting together, or antiport, meaning transport in opposite directions. Now actually, as three-dimensional atomic molecules, this is what we know about ion coupled transporters. It's actually not a serotonin transporter, it is a bacterial homolog that actually transports leucine. But it does bind fluoxetine uh, in a place where other experiments say is a reasonable place for fluoxetine to bind to serotonin transporters. So here's the outside surface of the cell and the inside surface, which I've drawn approximately correctly for the protein molecule. And here is the PDB file, which you can retrieve for yourself and examine. Now this is a, an atomic scale view, but it's a static view, and it doesn't give us the alternating access view. So let's look at some experiments that my group did several years ago trying to flesh out the alternating access model in a dynamic view. Another way to state the alternating access model, uh, model is that an ion coupled transporter looks a bit like an ion channel but with gates at both ends. So here it has an internal gate and an external gate the gates follow some rules. These rules are that they open when the molecules are bound in one place or another. The molecules get, bind, get bound and then the other gate opens. So we follow a cycle of substrate binding, gates opening and closing, and unbinding. Always the substrates include a neurotransmitter molecule in this case serotonin called 5-HT, and sodium. And in various neurotransmitter transporters, the co-transported ions can also include chloride and potassium. And my friends and I have spent a lot of time describing which transporters co-transport potassium ions and chloride ions in addition to sodium ions. We've also found that every once in a while, a neurotransmitter transporter makes a mistake, and it allows both gates to be open at once. This then makes the neurotransmitter transporter into an ion channel for a couple of milliseconds. We're not sure that this plays any role in the normal or even the abnormal operation of neurotransmitter transporters. Quite importantly, Various experiments have concluded that SSRIs and other blockers bind tightly to and stabilize intermediate states of neurotransmitter transporters. So they get the neurotransmitter transporter stuck at a particular part of the transport cycle, sometimes with one or more of the substrates present. And this is what prevents the neurotransmitter transporter from functioning when the blocker is present. 
The GABA transporter called GAT1 is inhibited by a drug called tiagabine, which is used as an anticonvulsant. By preventing the GABA transporter from acting, tiagabine presumably prolongs the lifetime of GABA near GABA receptors, prolonging inhibition, presumably decreasing the possibility of excess neuronal firing. Now, this observation that tiagabine prolongs the lifetime of the GABA suggests that under normal conditions, GABA transporters normally clear the, all of the 10,000 or so transmitter molecules from a single vesicle. So this is a pretty impressive job. And one way that we and others think this occurs is that it happens because GABA transporters are normally present at very high densities. So each of them needs to function only once after a vesicle is released. Well, what does very high mean? As you know, I like numbers. So we measured this density. And uh, we'll go back to the cerebellum, which as you've learned previously, is rich in GABA inhibition. We're going to talk about pictures of the molecular layer and of the granule cell layer and in between of the cell layer that contains the so-called Purkinje cells discovered by the anatomist Purkinje. These are the largest cells in the cerebellum. They're the ones that look like palms, either frontally viewed or from the side. So, the way experiments like this can be performed is by taking the gene for the transporter, which is now shown very schematically here as having 12 transmembrane helices, and linking to that gene the gene for green fluorescent protein. Embarrassingly, it looks blue here. So that one has a nearly fully functional GABA transporter that also is fluorescent. And using the proper techniques, one can then count the fluorescence and get a good calibration for how many GABA transporters are actually present. First, one needs to make a strain of mice that contain this GABA transporter GFP fusion in place of the normal GABA transporters. We call this a knock-in mouse because we haven't knocked out the gene. We've, we've replaced it by another one. These mice are perfectly happy and healthy. And the brain is fluorescent green in many areas. Here is the rostral part with the olfactory bulb, the caudal part with the brain stem, the dorsal part with as much cerebral cortex as a mouse has, and the ventral part. So we are going to concentrate on the cerebellum, and we are going to zoom in. Here's the molecular layer of the cerebellum with the nerve terminals of a large number of inhibitory GABAergic basket cells. And the green means that these basket cells are all expressing GABA transporter. The Purkinje cells are surrounded at the beginning of their axons by very heavy green fluorescence. These are the so-called pinceaux, uh, which is French for paintbrushes, and these are the presynaptic fibers of other GABAergic neurons. These nerve terminals are strong enough to veto, to shut down any action potential which might be otherwise fired by the Purkinje neuron. And finally, here's the granule cell layer, which has less GABAergic nerves in it. So the mouse, uh, this is our icon for the mouse, it has lots of green in its brain. Now we're going to zoom in even more on the molecular layer so that we begin to see, here is 50 microns across, in the molecular layer of the cerebellum, we begin to see the presynaptic nerve terminals of GABAergic neurons. Now, they're actually chains of nerve terminals. 
several nerve terminals along an axon. They're a couple of micrometers in diameter. And when we do the proper kinds of measurements on one of these nerve terminals, we find that the GABA transporter density is about 1,000 per square micron of membrane, which is just about enough to take care of GABA molecules that diffuse out from a single GABAergic vesicle when it has fused from the uh, presynaptic membrane to liberate GABA into synaptic clefts. One doesn't see the postsynaptic cells here. They're all around. One sees only the presynaptic green cells. So this is an example of the way neuroscientists study the targets for drugs and find out how many there are and whether they are where we expect them to be. Next time, we will talk about recreational drugs.